maybe as people are entering, um, our numbers are still slowly increasing, but I'll introduce myself and then our wonderful speaker today, Carolyn. Um, thank you and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second event in Intersections of Genders Research Friday series. My name is Nat Hurley, for those of you whom I have not yet met. I'm the Associate Director of Intersections of Gender Signature Area, as well as an Associate Professor in the Department of English and Film Studies, and the Director of Media and Technology Studies here at the University of Alberta. Before I introduce Carolyn, I want to recognize the conditions of possibility for our work here at the U of A, which is located on Treaty 6 territory and the lands of the Métis Nation, Region 4. We work and live on the traditional lands of the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others. Like all of our institutions, the U of A continues to be shaped by the forces of colonialism to the benefit primarily of white settlers. I consider myself an implicated subject who recognizes that the work of being in good relations to our Indigenous colleagues, communities, staff, and students is ongoing. And I would like to say again, uh, as I did in the first event, a little about Research Fridays. We imagine this space as a venue for you, the community at large, within and beyond the walls of the university to share and promote your research, thinking and conversations in lunch hour bite-sized pieces. Right now for presentations of work, we're using the webinar function in Zoom, but should, it be, um, should there be a wish for a more conversational style, we can also consider other formats. We're looking at showcasing works in progress, including recently published research, books, um, conference papers, or if you want to do a practice run of your conference paper or reprise it here, we'd be happy to have you. If you have a poster to share and discuss, if you'd like to do a Pecha Kucha or lead a teaching conversation, we're really open to anything. We want the space to be useful and creative in response to the community's needs. So please don't be shy if you don't see what you want reflected here in our suggestions. We really are open to anything you might want to do. The stakes are low, and so far we've found the audience to be really engaged. The only, room is, the only rule is that we would like there to be room for sharing the work and for others to engage in the work. So presentations for this hour, we like to keep roughly around 20 minutes, although I'm not going to um, you know, restrict that very carefully, but we are open to considering longer format options. We would just set, schedule those at a different time. And without further ado, allow me to introduce our uh, presenter today, Carolyn Carpen. Carolyn has a master's degree in women's studies and library and information studies. She has worked as an academic librarian for more than 20 years in the United States and Canada. She is the author of several books and articles, including the best-selling reference book, Rocked by Romance, a great title, <laughs> about young adult romance fiction, and Sisters, Schoolgirls, and Sleuths, Girls Series Books in America. She's going to be talking to us today about misogyny and abuse in the academic library workplace. So I'm gonna turn the Zoom over to you. Uh, I think you'll be sharing a screen with us and I will pin Carolyn so you get to just see her as the center of the show and I will recede into the background until the end when we'd be happy to take questions and conversations. I'd ask you to hold those until the end though and then I'd be happy to moderate. Okay, Carolyn, take it away. Thank you, Nat. Let me just get my screen sharing here. I just need to do couple of things. Okay, so I'm hoping everyone can see the screen. I want to say thank you for joining me for this conversation. Um, my topic is looking at the misogyny and abuse in the academic workplace. Oh, we're skipping ahead here. Let's exit that again. And so what I wanted to talk about today is um, 
an autoethnographic presentation reflecting on the relationship between misogyny and abuse that I have experienced in academic library workplaces during 15 years working as a practicing librarian, leader, and manager in American academic libraries. Carolyn, I'm not sure if you realize, but your notes are visible and you're not in full screen anymore. Yeah, no, that's okay. Okay, okay. all right, <laughs> great, no problem. I'm coming back with full screen here in a second. Uh, we need present, there we go. Okay, so is that better? Perfect, thank you. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is what is autoethnography. And it's a genre of writing and research that displays multiple layers of consciousness connecting the personal to the cultural. And this is a definition that comes from Ellis and Bachner. So why did I choose this as my method of telling my story? Kate Mann suggests that agency is not lacking when a woman is taking it upon herself to tell her story. So I'm trying to take back my agency by telling my story in this way. Kathleen DeLong argued in 2013 that the noted dearth of writing about women librarians emphasizes that the professional lives of women librarians are largely unknown, as is the importance of their contribution to the development of libraries and librarianship. Now, I have been interviewed by other librarian researchers about my story, and so pieces of my story have been published in journals and books um, elsewhere, but I've decided it's time to tell my own story myself, and it's the first time I'm linking the experience of abuse in academic libraries to the concept of misogyny. So, just a review, the definition of misogyny is hatred of, aversion to, or prejudice against women. So people are frightened of women who challenge gender norms and expectations in our workplaces. Kate Mann argues she appears vaguely threatening. She seems cold, distant, and arrogant, or alternatively pushy, knocking everyone who stands in her way ruthlessly. Moreover, Kate Mann suggests that misogyny threatens hostile consequences if she violates or challenges the relevant norms or expectations as a member of this gendered class of persons. And one of the things that thinking about this um, issue of misogyny has, has made me reconsider is a book that I read in my early days as a women's studies student in the 1990s. I was actually the first women's studies graduate from the new program at Dalhousie University in 1992. And one of the books I read in the very first class I took was called The Politics of Reality by Marilyn Fry. And in this book, Marilyn Fry talks about how women can be complicit in their own oppression, as well as the oppression of other women. So it's got me thinking about the fact that the profession of librarianship is made up of approximately 80% women. In my experience, many women working in librarianship are complicit in maintaining workplace misogyny. Now, I want to define workplace abuse. Um, in her study, The Low Morale Experience of Academic Librarians, Katrina Davis Kendrick found that the experience of low morale in library workplaces begins with a trigger event of abuse. And so she defines workplace abuse in four different categories, verbal or written abuse, emotional abuse, system abuse, and negligence on the parts of colleagues and library leaders. The abuse causes low morale for the librarian who experiences it, and she notes that the abuse is often long-term. 
Now, full disclosure here, I am one of the people who Kendrick interviewed for her study um, after I returned to Canada. So in my experience, what does workplace misogynistic abuse look like? So the first category I have here is pranks. Um, so I've experienced several different pranks. Uh, someone put my office name tag on a painting of a man that hung next to my office and they put his name tag on my office door. So to me, that speaks very loudly about my not meeting gendered expectations and norms. Another time I got a threatening phone call in my campus office and when the campus police investigated, they discovered it had come from a colleague on a library telephone. The next category is incivility. Incivility looks like ignoring colleagues when walking by or rolling your eyes in contempt instead of saying hello. It also looks like being left out of meetings you should be included in or not being given information you need to do your job. And I'm talking about the purposeful not giving of information, not the occasional you know, communication mix-ups that can happen. Now, the category of bullying can be quite large. Um, bullying in academic libraries can look like disruption of meetings, sabotaging of people's work, verbal and written abuse, mind games, financial abuse, and threats of physical violence. So I'm going to talk about some of these categories in more detail here. And the first one is verbal abuse. Verbal abuse can occur in the office when someone yells at you or makes snide comments. I once had a library leader say to me, I'm glad to see you're finally earning all that money I'm paying you. This was a job in which I was managing several departments at a time due to their retention problems. And because of these retention problems, most of the time I worked there, I not only ran multiple departments at a time, but I was running searches to fill both staff and librarian jobs in multiple departments. And of course, those of us who work in academia know that running job searches is not a small, a small task. Another time a colleague yelled at me when they got upset about something. They got more upset when I refused to be yelled at and closed my office door. This was then deemed as an interpersonal problem by our manager who forced me to meet with them first in a mediated situation and then one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, the job was over for me when the colleague during a one-on-one -on -one meeting closed a conference room door and made a verbal threat against me. So another category is mind games. And of course, in recent years, I think the, the concept of gaslighting has become uh, very familiar to people. I have found that mind games such as gaslighting can be prevalent in academic libraries. In one organization, I was told I took things too personally. Then I was told during performance reviews that I was too ambitious for both me and my staff. Now I thought that was very insulting to the staff who had all been hired before I came in to be the department leader. They told me also that I was too Northeast. My immediate reaction, I'm thinking, you know, what part of I'm from the Northeast was not clear on my CV. I was born and raised in the Northeast. I did my education in the Northeast. I've worked in the Northeast of the US. As Olin and Millet noted in 2015, women librarians are often told they are too, too. So just call me Carolyn Tutu. In another academic library, 
when I took on a new leadership role, my colleague, who I actually thought of as my friend, told me I was being thrown to the lions, meaning that my colleagues had made a conscious decision to make it very difficult for me to do my new job. And they certainly did. Another category is financial abuse. When I took on leadership roles in several organizations that required more responsibility, I had to negotiate compensation for the extra work. I was more or less told that I was expected to do the work without more comp compensation, and it was given to me grudgingly. In one of the cases, library leadership took advantage of the fact that I was on a medical leave to ask if I would do more work when I returned. They actually called me while I was on a Family Medical Leave Act time for major surgery, and they called me within matter of days of my getting out of the hospital, um, and they asked me to do more work. Compensation was never mentioned at all. So once I was feeling a little bit better and back on my feet, I called the HR office to let them know that I had agreed, had agreed to do the work and I negotiated compensation for that extra work. I have experienced physical threats from colleagues in academic libraries. In one library, one of my supervisees worked hard to make me feel of a, afraid of a colleague that we knew owned guns. They would tell me their former supervisor was afraid of this person and that I should watch out when I went to the parking lot. I became more concerned after the colleague I was supposed to be afraid of was the same one who had yelled at me and made, made a verbal threat to me behind a closed door. Now, of all the bullying tactics, I have to say I truly never expected to experience any kind of physical threats against my life. And to this day, this remains shocking to me. And it's, it's shocking when I tell other people about that. Every evening, I walked to my car wondering if I would be attacked. When I got home, I sat on the sofa wondering if a bullet or a brick would be thrown thrown through my living room window. A long distance boyfriend came to visit me and he spent a day or two in my office and the library. I dealt with the stress by exercising and I took up running. When I realized I was literally trying to run away from the stressful job situation, I realized I had no choice but to leave the job because no one was protecting me from abusive and potentially violent colleagues in my workplace. So mobbing is what happens when a group of people work together to bully a person. And I would say in more than one library I was mobbed. Many of these things happened very close together and in quicker succession as the mobbing kind of picked up. And going back to Kendrick's definition of abuse, this was compounded in multiple organizations by system abuse and negligence on the part of the library and university administration. Now, as Kathleen DeLong noted in 2013, women who aspire to leadership positions in libraries should be aware that the pace of change and acceptance of women in leadership roles continues to be slow, perhaps even slackening, and they will continue to find barriers and obstacles to surmount in attaining the career and leadership roles that they desire. So I'm wishing I had met Kathleen before I came to the University of Alberta. Navigating misogyny and abuse in multiple ac academic libraries left me feeling ashamed, sick, exhausted, and burned out. With PTSD, myriad physical health problems, and a lack of confidence in my abilities. 
At conferences, some professional friends and colleagues refused to speak with me, leaving me to wonder what was being said about me in professional circles. This was the intent of misogynist and abusive colleagues, to wear me down so I would give up, leave organizations, or leave the LIS profession altogether. Kate Mann argues that misogynistic attacks frequently instill a sense of shame in their victims, partly via disgust-based smearing mechanisms. Kate Mann argues misogyny is manifested by individuals, collective activity, and structural mechanisms. She states that misogyny taken alone involves anxieties, fears, and desires to maintain a patriarchal order and a commitment to restoring the order when it is disrupted. So the abuse of women is intended to silence, control, and disempower women in society. And so it say, serves the same purpose in the workplace, including academic libraries. How is workplace abuse and misogyny related to power and control? So this is one of the questions I'm still thinking about. We heard a quote previously that talks a little bit about those connections, but this is one of the areas I'm still thinking about and researching and reading about. I do see some correlation between domestic abuse and workplace abuse. And I, I was able to find in the nursing literature, a nursing professor from Ontario had taken the uh, Duluth power and control wheel, which is an open um, product that people can, can take and kind of re, reframe however they need to. Uh, but traditionally it was focused on domestic abuse. And Heidi Scott, the nursing professor has reorganized it for the nursing workplace and it's quite similar uh, to what I see in academic libraries and the one of the common themes I think between those two um, two kinds of workplaces is that they are largely made up of women working in those professions and they're also um, you know helping and serving professions so this is an area I'm going to be thinking more about and perhaps reaching out to Dr. Scott to find out a little bit more about this. But what does the woman leader do when she feels that she's fighting an uphill battle without allies and is treated differently because of her gender? She must begin to confront the situation and document mistreatment. So that's what I'm trying to do by starting with a presentation and then hopefully a publication about this. Um, this quote comes from Olin and Millet, who in 2015 wrote an article about gendered expectations for library leadership. And to quote them, they say, there is a clear gender bias in both how employees view their bosses and what their expectations are for those leaders. And then they go on to say that the question for us now is, what do we do to change th these perceptions? If anything, and more importantly, what can we do to help our peers who understand this struggle and those who will come after us. For me, uh, since I've been voted off the leadership island several times, I'm pursuing informal rather than formal leadership roles in academic libraries. I do agree though that in order to pave the way for other women leaders in libraries, Olin and Millet argue for safe environments for women to share their experiences. So this is why I've chosen to come to intersections of gender first with my uh, early stages of research. I have also put in to do a presentation in a similar um, environment in the 
University of Alberta Libraries. Uh, so we'll see if I have that opportunity to, opportunity to speak more to my colleagues about this. I see looking at misogyny and workplace abuse and articulating what it looks like and thinking about how we can stop it as a way I can provide leadership in the profession. So I think really we need a new kind of library leadership and management. We need to stop using abuse as a management tool. In an article I found in the International Journal of Manpower, um, Gardner et al. have suggested that the solutions lie not with fixing individuals via training, stress management, and well-being programs, but with effective systems, procedures, policies, and leadership that recognize the power dynamics at work. So we've added then to this list, we need effective systems, procedures, and policies against misogyny and abuse. And we need to hire leaders who recognize power dynamics. We also need women to support each other rather than working against each other. And ideally, we want everyone to be working together to eliminate misogyny and abuse in our workplaces. So what does all of this have to do with librarianship and intersectionality? I'm struggling to understand how we can discuss making our libraries and our library organizations more equitable, diverse, inclusive, and anti-racist without discussing the problems wrought by misogyny. How can we argue that Black Lives Matter or that we must decolonize the library when women leading the way are already abused and threatened in their workplaces? How can we recruit and retain diverse voices into the library profession when ghosts of misogynists like Mel Melville Dewey still haunt us? We have to address the intersectional oppressions caused by racism, sexism, classism, xenophobia, and misogyny if we truly want to change the library profession and make library workplaces safe and supportive for everyone. We cannot leave misogyny out of our conversations. And here is my list of references that I have cited through the presentation. And then I've put my contact information here. If anybody wants to reach out after, uh, after the presentation, there's a number of different ways you can, can reach me. So Nat, I'm turning it back over to you. I think you might have to unshare your screen. Okay. Okay, there we go. Thank you so much. What a important and challenging and well, in some ways disheartening topic. <laughs> And, and yet, this is so important for us to have this conversation. So thank you. It's also, I know, uh, even more challenging when one is talking about one's own experiences, because there's a kind of uh, feeling of, you know, kind of putting yourself out there in a whole different way. And I know that these presentations that we do about our work always is a way of putting ourselves out there, but this is a whole, at a whole different level. So uh, I just wanted to say how grateful we are for you to uh, bring your voice to this conversation and to give us an opportunity to talk about what it might mean to kind of develop more progressive, supportive, feminist, non-misogynistic and non-abusive uh, workplaces for our libraries because we all need these spaces and we all have an investment in ensuring that they thrive and support uh, not just the people who use them, but the people who create those spaces. So, so thank you so very much. Um, I see also that the chat is also <laughs> full of many thank yous. So, so I think that you can already get a sense of, of how many uh, people are grateful for you to sh for shining a light on, on these concerns. Um, 
the floor is open to questions and I would be very happy to uh, represent the questions uh, if you want to add them to the Q&A, add them to the chat. Um, and I know, um, Carolyn, because we, we've spoke about, spoken about this before, um, that not all of these experiences, that most of these experiences, that you, if not all of them that you've spoken about were from your time before the University of Alberta. Yes. And maybe if I could kick off the conversation, um, I wonder what, what you would say for um, what those experiences lead you to suggest might be some better paths forward for us. Right to consider not in terms of critiquing what we have here at the U of A, but improving what we have. If, if you see what I mean, right? I'm not sure that we need to say, "Oh, this is wrong here." But what is it that we could do to, as a university community, to help support the kinds of change that you would like to see? I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I think we need to be willing to hear people's stories and willing to talk about them openly mm -hmm. um, and not just feel like we're trying to punish a particular person or group of people, but mm -hmm. rather improve, as you say, the, the community for the whole of, of the university. Mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. of course, my experience in the States showed me that when dealing with all of this, your work with students and faculty suffers because you're focused on all this other stuff going on in the office that doesn't need to be happening and shouldn't be happening. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, you know, I expected um, that my colleagues, wherever I worked, would be professional and not behave like children by bullying people. I mean, it makes me think about, you know, the bullies in the schoolyard. Um, and I think we, we should be more professional than that. Um, and so I think it really comes down to just being willing to talk about things and for leaders to be willing to hear critiques of their leadership. I mean, often we don't have that 360 review uh, option that allows us to review our bosses, right? <laughs> um, and that's the kind of thing that would help if, if leaders were open to that. Um, in some universities and colleges, the structure can be more hierarchical. And so there isn't the opportunity to give that kind of feedback up the up the chain and of course one of the things I think about too is how the people who hire typically will hire the leader of the library um, those are going to be other campus administrators who maybe don't know what's happening in the library all that well just because they don't spend their time working in the library all day and so I think it's challenging for people who come in, especially, you know, if they're coming in from outside of the, the library altogether to be, to be the leader because they may not know of some of these challenges. They may not be willing to handle some of these challenges and it may not be among the priorities that the, you know, the administrators who've hired them have set when in fact the you know the culture of the entire library may be in need of fixing before anything can happen i mean i will say in one of the libraries i worked in people were so unproductive because of all the foolishness that went on um, that it was it kind of blew my mind um, and i'm not the only person who has left that organization to feel that way <laughs> you know any efforts to increase productivity of of people's work failed because of the culture there and and what i hear you to be saying in that is that we need a structural solution not just a kind of top-down leadership set of decisions that will change just not just who we hire but how we incorporate people into workplaces many of the things that you've described i think exist in other workplaces across campus too and so that there 
maybe um, opportunities for solidarity rather than thinking you know, uh, that the people who are leaving us on top can solve our problems on their own, that there may be a way for us to, to mobilize together. And I think this goes to the question that we just received in, in the Q&A from Christina Harbach, uh, who wonders what the role of unions um, has or could be in an instance of insidious misogyny in the library workplace. Have unions in their own ways um, and their leaders upheld patriarchal systems of abuse and misogyny? And maybe, you know, that's one structural place we think of as helping to kind of defend the rights of workers, but, you know, perhaps this is also compromised. And what, is, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I did have a conversation with a librarian who's very vocal about unionizing. Um, her name is Emily Drabinsky. And she also edits a um, book series, a feminist book series with Library Juice Press. And, you know, she's she's extremely keen and fond of, of organizing formally. And my concern about that, honestly, is that that might work in some regions of the US, but it doesn't work everywhere. I mean, some of the places I worked were in the South. The South, for obvious reasons, does not have any kind of culture of unionizing and supporting workers. <laughs> um, and so I think it's, you know, in my experience, it's more about the culture of the library and the culture of the um, university or college altogether. One of the things I've noticed that seems to help is if librarians are considered faculty. So if they have the equivalent status as faculty, then they can participate in the governance process and they can be more a part of the functioning of the, the university instead of sort of being off to the side the way a lot of libraries are. So I don't think unionizing and organizing is the only answer because there's some places where it's just not going to happen and that's certainly the case, I think, in some of the places where I worked. Now, I think, you know, the faculty status issue does protect women in some ways, because if you've achieved tenure, you know, then you've got that job protection. Um, and I've worked in both situations where I've achieved tenure and had that protection and in other places where, where that was not the case. Well, and I'm thinking as well, though, of the work of someone like Sarah Ahmed. I don't know if you know her work. She has a new book out called Complaint. And one of the things that she's been arguing based on her own experience with dealing with workplace harassment and also with um, how it is that universities and university workplaces feel complaints is that when you uh, describe the problem, you become the problem, that this is that yes. the, the complainers or the, the, the kind of people who kind of voice uh, or give voice to um, these concerns as you have, then this also becomes uh, its own management problem and you become uh, the target of a different kind of attention for having brought attention to other problematic, often abusive uh, behaviors. And, and I wonder if um, not only, I mean, wonder if, if you have any thoughts about that. I mean, she's really eloquent and it seems like her work might be, uh, I mean, it's just a brand new book. It's not, I'm not saying you should have read it. It just came out, came out five minutes ago okay. um, <laughs> University Press, but it seems really relevant. And this is a conversation yeah. that she's been pressing in other contexts of her work for some time now. And she in fact resigned a tenured position at Goldsmiths in London to, um, because she was so unhappy with the, the ways her university workplace had dealt with mm -hmm. the fact of complaints. Right, and, and harassment cases on her campus. And, and I just wonder if that's a helpful way to describe some of the dynamics that, that you're also characterizing here, that once you kind of give voice to them, they, that also kind of amplifies the problem. Yes, absolutely. That was my experience. Um, at one institution, I chose to leave when things got too toxic and at another institution, I was laid off at the opportunity when the campus was doing a major restructuring. And both my boss and I, who 
um, in in the, the wording of where I come from, <laughs> where people are come from a ways. <laughs> um, you know, we both got laid off in a situation where they decided that we were not a fit for the organization, but they didn't have to phrase it that way. They were able to sort of build it into this, the structure of the layoffs and, you know, the, all mm -hmm. of the processes that went with that. Um, so yes, if you speak up, you're the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and m in my experience in the States, there was no support from um, university administration or human resources. Um, that may be different in other places and maybe better in Canadian universities. Mm -hmm. And um, as the, there's some conversation in the chat, I don't know if you see that this is also uh, one of the things that Ahmed also points out is that racism in the same way becomes an injury to whiteness, sexism becomes an injury to men. And so the, the discourse about who the victim is in these contexts of, of, of power abuse uh, becomes inverted so that the dominant group inoculates itself from critique right. by saying you are vic you are victimizing us you are canceling us and, right. and I wonder if, if um if there if there's a way or what it what, how, what you've seen in your experience is the interplay between racism and misogyny as you've described it and or sorry misogyny and abuse as you've described it and racism in the context of some of these workplaces? I mean, do you see that there's a kind of concentration of attention uh, or kind of whitening of the problem? Or like, it, it, I mean, maybe I'm wondering if we can tease out the intersectional part of it a little bit too, to see, you know, yeah. do you find that women who are from other, who are members of other demographic categories as well um, are more vulnerable to these kinds of things or maybe you have different observations to make? Thoughts? Well, it's tough for me to know because, mm -hmm. you know, there are not that many BIPOC people in, or certainly when I started my career, there were not in academic libraries. Um, Which may be its own symptom too, right? Right. Um, in one place I worked, there was one African-American woman and she had not achieved tenure, but she stayed on in a staff position. But there was tension between her and the staff because she was in a staff role, yet she took advantage of like, say a longer Christmas break like faculty and like the other librarians who were faculty got to do. So there were definitely some tensions in there that, she, you know, she had to navigate and that the rest of us, you know, because we heard complaints from people, <laughs> you know, there were, there were definitely challenges around their decisions to, for whatever reason, because I don't know, this all happened before I had arrived at this institution, how, how you know, how they, didn't give her tenure and then chose to keep her in a staff role. So mm -hmm. um, one, of the Sorry. one of the institutions that I chose to leave, um, racism was a huge, huge problem there. Um, there were conflicts between the African American Studies Department and other, other people in the history department on that campus. Um, and, you know, I, I heard through the grapevine stories of bullying and so on, but I don't know, you know, I didn't see any of it up close. Um, so it's harder to speak on that, but there were, there were incidents where the students were displaying their racism in great, <laughs> Uh, great big ways that people couldn't miss. And there was one, one evening where phone calls were made all around to staff and faculty who worked on the campus to go to the campus to help support BIPOC students who were being threatened by a theme of a party. Um, and by the, even the, the poster for the party was considered racist. Um, and so people kind of knew to be 
paying attention to what was happening on campus that night. Um, after that, they did bring in a trainer to come and speak to um, speak to people on campus. But of course, it was interested people. They couldn't force the training on anybody. And so the training was very much, um, you know, the people you'd expect to show up on a Saturday morning on their own time. And it kind of left out the people that probably needed the training. Um, there was a meeting that followed that with, with a group of students that was quite interesting and I think informative for the students where, um, you know, there was a discussion about the issues around the, the party that had happened and, you know, their posters and, and so on. So um, I, th I think, I hope the students left with, you know, a different view on things from that yeah. particular meeting. Um, there were some things that happened in the library too. <laughs> um, there was some racist graffiti on the outside of the building, the library building, and it, the building was actually my responsibility. So I was the one who had to call um, and get that removed. And fortunately that was removed pretty quickly and that was kind of the end of it. But another incident that happened that still really bothers me and I, I don't know what else I could have done to handle it differently. Um, one evening we had a student who threw something, a male student who threw something at a female student and the next day when we came into work the young woman who would had something thrown at her plastered posters all over the library on tables on like anywhere she could talking about what had happened to her that previous evening and so I called you know called the dean of students and said help <laughs> you know here here I'm gonna fax this poster over to you we've got someone who's having a conflict with another student and this is how they're choosing to deal with it and I need some support here um, and one of my staff members had alerted me to these posters so I went around and just collected them up and for me, that was kind of the end of it. I thought I had done my job. I had done what was necessary. And then at the end of that acad academic year, I walked into one of the staff offices and the staff was taking pictures of a male student holding his degree up right in front of him like he was taking a mug shot. And I kind of said to them, what's going on here? What is this? And they told me, well, this is, you know, we're, we're kind of making fun of him as he's leaving because of what happened several months ago. And I'm like, what do you mean? Well, what it turned out was that he was the student who had thrown something at somebody and he was a student worker in the library and everyone that worked in the library chose not to tell me that and instead you know the people that worked with him had to manage his conflicts with other students of color that worked in the library and it was really a terrible situation I guess and no one informed me of it and when I asked someone you know why didn't anybody tell me about this? Why didn't you tell me about this? I was told, well, you would have fired him and we didn't want him to lose his job. So, you know, he's graduating. So, you know, now, and now it's wow, all over but, because he's graduating. But there would be the assumption is that you would not have um, followed due process in terms of, I mean, the assumption is also an assumption against you. And, I mean, as you're yep. talking, I mean, I see, I hear so many contradictions in, I mean, we think about, like, I think our fantasy version of a university is a place of this kind of free exchange of knowledge and development of ideas and the pursuit of education and education has a kind of liberal liberationist mode to it, but it also seems that at every turn, there are these informal mechanisms that block people from being either able either to progress through to leadership positions, what some people call the leaky pipeline that prevents some people from becoming, say, university librarians, and you describe that as a fairly white space in your experience. 
and that there are other mechanisms and that block people of color from entering into that workspace. And then uh, uh, other mechanisms, again, that block uh, possibilities through abuse, bullying, pranks, all the tactics that you've described for those who find their way in but are somehow not created, don't have opportunities created for them. And then students also seem like, you think of university as one thing, but the library at the university then is an even more intensified version of this space, which seems to be something that you're also, I think, implicitly pointing to that the library becomes a forgive the military metaphor, but a kind of battleground for some of the tensions that exist all over campus and get concentrated in that space. And that's part of what I hear in the, the, the student conflicts that you've described here, where students get things thrown at them or students themselves kind of voice racist or problematic um, positions and that sort of thing. And, and I wonder like, what, what do you think it is about the library? Is this, like, as I'm describing it, does that seem like, kind of, does it accord with your experience of it? But, you know, is the library that symbolic space that kind of, where you get in more intense versions of some of these things you see elsewhere on campus? Or is it more structurally similar to what you hear or see in other parts of the university campus? Well, I think it's probably similar to what you'd see in here on other parts of the campus. The only difference is, I think, because it's creating space for students, some things happen out of view of staff and librarians who then don't really know what happened. So in this situation, the students were in a classroom and nobody saw what had happened between these students. It was just, you know, the student's account plus her friends and, you know, whatever, whatever, happened was discussed in that way but nobody saw it mm -hmm. um, and so it was hard it would have been harder had I had more information to still intervene and figure out what was the right thing to do in that situation given given that it happened away from anybody who was in an mm -hmm. adult situation who could have maybe gone and spoken to the students right away you know that so it's difficult. The library creates space purposely for students to be comfortable, to be able to study, to have access to, you know, all of the tools and things they need to do their research and their learning. And so um, that's go and go always going to be part of the library's mission. <laughs> and as somebody points out in the chat, the library is also a very hierarchical system, or mm -hmm. it has a hierarchical system in place. And it's interesting yeah. that um, you also said somebody in an adult situation. And I think it's also, um, I think more and more true that um, however this has happened, that we sometimes think of our students as not being adults yet. And this has to do with a whole other kind of, not, with, not within you, but I think within the culture and society at large, that developmental stories about young people seem to suggest that they don't really they're not really adults when they reach us in a way that this is a historical shift, right? Historically, right. people reach adulthood at a younger age than we seem to somehow suggest that they do right now. So this is an, it's an interesting dynamic that we face here, right? Um, well, and that's something I absorbed from the culture of the particular yeah. places I worked. So I wanted to see, there's one question here in the, in the chat I, from I, Mary. I Oh, I did not see it. Uh, must, might have only gone directly to you because I've been monitoring. Um, okay, I wanted to answer it. So the question is, what can a woman do when she's not able to leave her job and move to another one? Well, that's really, that's really tough. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I know people do stay put and put up with whatever the culture of the organization is because they don't have the choice, whether it's, um, you know, they, they don't want to leave where they live because of family, because of children in school, all of, all of these other parts of our lives that are important. Um, I think a lot of people just stay put and put up with it or they look for other jobs in their area that might be in a better, you know, a better managed 
organization that doesn't have these kinds of problems. But I don't know that there are many great solutions. You know, as, as a single woman who was willing to be mobile, I was able to move around. And so, you know, that, that was a privilege and a benefit that I had that maybe others, others don't have. And I apologize, Mary, I missed that question in the chat. I thought I was monitoring very carefully. Um, although maybe one, also, one answer to this is to try and build solidarities through conversations like this and having people be courageous and brave enough to speak up and then other people may be able to find and join that conversation in hopes of pushing back and creating some change. That may be an optimistic solution, but it does also seem like that is something that can come of, of a conversation like the one Carolyn is is starting for us today. Um, I, I want to point out too that uh, Katrina Davis Kendrick is here with us and she's pointed out she's okay. got the leaving low morale study. So she has continued to look at the issue of low morale and abuse in various different kinds of libraries. And so her latest research is focused on leaving low morale study and there may be some more answers to Mary's question in that work. Thank you for pointing that out and we have another question in the chat as well um, from Lebo Dizel. I hope I've pronounced your name correctly. I wonder what space there is in making the library a safe space to consider who students are and what safe spaces look like and for which students. Do you have any thoughts on that? Hmm. Wow. <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, yes, I think that the people that manage libraries should be talking to students to, to find out what kinds of things happen to them that maybe indicate we have an unsafe environment. Um, I've certainly heard stories of other kinds of things, including sexual assaults happening in libraries. Um, if we don't know about these things, there's nothing we can do about them. So I think making sure we have that channel of communication open with students, and there's different ways to do that. Many libraries have a student um, advisory group, so students can basically self-select to join a group that's interested in talking more about the library and how to how to make the library maybe more student oriented or student centered and to hear their their concerns so that's definitely one way that many libraries try to reach students also you've got your cadre of student staff that you can work with um, and often student staff are consulted on on issues relating to students as well because they're people that we know and we work with them and they're more comfortable talking directly to us about different things that happen in libraries. Um, these are the kinds of things that we do. Maybe, maybe we're not doing enough of that or maybe some libraries aren't doing enough of that. I know one of the libraries I worked at really did not care about what students thought about anything. Um, and I know this because I tried to lead as part of a renovation project. I was leading a group of students to look at a specific space in the building to see how to make it more comfortable and more suitable for them and what were their concerns about the room and, you know, and they, there were lots of good suggestions and we kind of did it with students from the student advisory group, right? We invited a few of them to come and meet with us and one of the library administrators worked with me on this and when we tried to present it as here, we did this little pilot project, this was something we were concerned about it was completely rejected and we were told they didn't want to know what the students thought and wow. eventually the company that was hired to do the renovation got tired of waiting for us to provide them with student feedback and they went out with cameras and interviewed students on campus mm -hmm. they just went you know went to the campus center and started talking to students <laughs> 
Yeah, the, the conversation about what safety looks like on campus is really a complicated one. On the one hand, there are ways of refusing to know where unsafe space is. And then the, on the flip side of that, there's the, the weaponization of safe space against any kinds of conversations that might make dominant groups feel threatened or to have to change their mind. I think especially about some of the conversations in the US right now about, the, about critical race theory and yep. how dangerous this is for for young people to learn about and I just think, yeah. wow, okay, so safety becomes then a way of an a way of inoculating us against having uh, ever to be dislodged from our certainties too. So so this becomes a way of protecting some students, and I think this goes to the spirit of the, the comment in the chat at the expense of others, and then the real dangerous situations are not being attended to for anybody, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, well, and, and it's 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 telling students that knowledge is unsafe by yeah, talking exactly. about critical race theory as something that's unsafe to learn. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a totally different kind of safety problem than you might have, you know, in campus spaces. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, I find that very scary. Um, but, um, you know, there is also the issue of making campus space is safe for students, including the libraries. And it's- Absolutely. And for the workers, as you've pointed out, as for the people who work in these spaces, for all of us. And I'm aware um, there's so much more to be said about this conversation. And we are now a couple of minutes over our time, I'm, I'm sorry to say. And I want to just thank everybody for coming and thank you, especially Carolyn, for kind of providing this, you know, robust set of um, narratives, experiences, conceptualizations of this problem and for talking with us all about it for the past hour or so. I really appreciate it. There's obviously so much more to say and we could just keep going and going and going. Um, but uh, I want to again thank you all. Thank you Carolyn most of all. I appreciate you all coming. Please come back again for our future events. Please let me know if you would like to have a conversation with us here of your own about your own work. And uh, I hope we can return to many of these uh, points of discussion because uh, as we know, these, these things are not going away. Those problems that are really kind of um, pressing and they seem to somehow reproduce themselves because we haven't figured out how best to deal with them. So um, that's, that's the kind of work we need to all keep doing together. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope you have a nice rest of your Fridays. Keep well as possible. And um, please come back and join us again. Thanks again, Carolyn. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.